Good morning and welcome to Harrisonville Church of the Nazarene for our online service today, April 19th, 2020. I am so glad that you've joined us for this service as we continue our series, Do You Need a Faith Lift? And we're going to look at one of my favorite stories today, the ultimate underdog story of David versus Goliath. We want to teach you how to faith your giants. God can help you do that. So I want to encourage you right now, why don't you take a moment greet everybody here on Facebook. Go ahead and leave a comment. Let us know you're here. Let us let the other folks know you're here with us. And Austin will get ready to lead us here in just a minute in a couple of songs. Again, we're glad that you've joined us. Let's pray. Father, we pray that as we have uh, this service today here in this church, that your spirit would descend upon every home. May you be pleased. May you be praised. May you be lifted up. May we be changed. May you be glorified. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning, Harrisonville Church of the Nazarene. We're glad you joined us this morning. Let's worship our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Well, it's that time, and we want to take up our tithes and offerings today. I want to give you a quick announcement. We are really exploring Zoom and ways that we can keep connected through Zoom. I led a group through a Bible study this week, this past week, Wednesday at 6 o'clock. We're going to do it again this week. If you would like to be a part of the Zoom meeting, all you need to do is email me and let me know, and I will email you a link so that you can get, a, be a, get on and be a part of that meeting with us. All you have to do, and it's really very simple, you go to Google and you put how do I download Zoom and it will walk you through step by step how to do it. If you need help, we'd be more than happy to help you do it. And we're really going to be looking at some ways we can incorporate Zoom in the upcoming weeks as well through for Sunday school classes and things like that, especially if this continues to drag on uh, at the way it has so far. We're going to t uh, ask you right now, some of you have already done this again. The checks have just been coming in. People are getting online and giving. You can do giving right now at harrisonvillenas.org. Just go to the website. The bottom of that home page has a link for giving. You can go on there. I did it this week. Very simple to do it. And if you want to do that, just feel free to do that right now. I'm not going to make any uh, strong push except to say that we have a great opportunity to finish the year strong. We are just a little short for what was projected on income for the church year. And as I said two weeks ago, all it would take is $60 this month, $60 extra next month, above and beyond the tithe. And actually, if you do the math on that, that'd be $100, $120, which would actually be a tithe of one stimulus check. A tithe means 10%. And if you feel led to do that, I know times are hard. I'm not going to make a strong push. I'm simply letting you know the opportunity is before us to finish strong. And I believe it could be a great yay God moment for us when we come back and have one more thing to celebrate. Just pray about it. See how God leads you. And if you can do that, we'd greatly appreciate it. And God will bless the cheerful giver. I want to take a moment to pray. Uh, not f specifically for the offering, but I felt led just to pray for, our, for you, for our country, and everybody in our community at this time. So I'd ask you, even right there at your home, would you take a moment, let's bow our heads and pray together. Father, we come to you right now. I want to lift up President Trump, Mike Pence, the team that he has around him helping him through this COVID-19 crisis. We pray for uh, Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy. We lift up our governor, Mike Parson. We lift up our mayor, our city council, our health care workers, our first responders. God, give wisdom. We ask for protection. We ask you to guide them and lead them as they lead us and help us to be good followers at this time, to honor and obey the leaders that you put in charge of us. God, we pray for people who have lost loved ones in this crisis, that you'd be their comforter and their counselor. We pray for those who have lost jobs, that you'd be their provider. We pray for those who are sick, that you'd be Jehovah Rapha, their healer. I pray grace and peace upon your people. Help us to learn what it means to feed on your faithfulness, Father. Help us to learn to trust you even in the difficult times. Give us a faith lift today. Give us the faith we need to walk through these difficult days and stare down our giants. No giant is too big for you, Father. Giants are scary and they're powerful, and we have to dress ourselves in our armor, and we have to watch, and we have to pray, but you are our friend, and we put our faith in you. May you be glorified in our lives through this time. Help us to remember that you, can, that you can use what you do not cause. In the mighty name of our resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you. I ask my son, John, Pastor John, to preach the message for us today. And he's going to be talking to us about facing our giants. God bless. To secure the promised land, the Israelites must defeat the Philistines. The 
King Saul has lost God's blessing. And now he faces the Philistines' greatest champion, Goliath. will be your slaves. I win. And you will be our slaves. Someone must fight him. Not you, Jonathan. The warrior who defeats him will be a rich man. Not one man in Israel. Not one of God's people. I'll do it. You're no soldier, you're a shepherd. Yes, a shepherd. As I protect my sheep, God will protect me. Where is your faith? Where is your God? I will kill him. You'll need this. I'll be better without it. Yea, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. You are with me. The Hyrod and staff, they comfort me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Good morning, church. It's such an honor and very humbling for me to be able to share God's word with you today, even if we can't be face to face. As I was reflecting on our sermon series of Do You Need a Faith Lift, I was very intrigued about how much honor and prestige we give to the quote unquote winners in today's society. Here in Chiefs Kingdom, of course, we're celebrating our first Super Bowl championship in 50 years. And just five years ago, the Kansas City Royals celebrated their first World Series championship in 50 years. Both are very worthy and amazing accomplishments for these two teams. And it was, uh, I was thinking more about them. And I was thinking about the teams themselves. Their very names invoke a sense of honor, a sense of awe, the Chiefs and the Royals. Our most popular shoe brand here in America, Nike. The very name Nike means victory or to conquer in the Greek. We don't have to have such an amazing memory to remember the newly crowned heavyweight champion of the world, Tyson Fury, as he rode into the ring on a literal podium with a throne and a crown on his head. And to his credit, he did end up winning. Even in our scripture, we see Paul remind us in 1 Corinthians to run in such a way to get the crown. Or in the words of Christ, he says, to those who have, more will be given, and to those who do not have, even what little they do have will be taken away. The horrible or beautiful, depends on which side of the fence you are on. Truth. 
is that history is written by the victor. A hundred years from now, we're not going to be highlighting Emmanuel Sanders being overthrown by Jimmy Garoppolo as much as we're going to highlight the amazing comeback in the fourth quarter of Patrick Mahomes. In the same way, we just celebrated Christ's victory over death 2,000 years after the fact. He ascended into heaven now, and he rules over the world. And 50 days after his ascension, the Holy Spirit descended upon the world and connected forever heaven and earth. And this Pentecost is still alive and raging today. We're so caught up in today's modern America of Christianity being just a religion, just something we do on Sundays that doesn't apply to the rest of our life, that we don't realize that it's much, much more than that. It's a reorientation of universal world history that's been rewritten from an endless bloodbath from one world power to another to that of a king who emptied himself out of heaven. He was stripped naked and he was murdered on a cross. And he rose bodily from the grave and is now reigning as the true Lord over the earth. The question asked of many Christians today is, why evil? Why the coronavirus? And I could go many hours talking about this, but I, I don't feel like any of you want to hear that, nor do I think it would do any good as philosophers for the last 2,000 years have tried to answer this to no avail. But I'm here to encourage you today that even in the midst of this pandemic, and even in the midst of all our giants, Christ is still king. God is still in control, and God is going to get us through this pandemic. But I'm also here to warn you that while Christ promised us eternal life, and he promised us victory over death, Sometimes that victory doesn't come in this life. Sometimes we have to suffer spiritual death and sometimes even physical death to attain all the glory that God has for us. We're commanded to take up our cross. We're not commanded to be victors. We're commanded to be sufferers for Christ's name's sake. And now more than ever is the time for the church to be the church, to reach into the world with prayer and with love as we seek to transfigure a fallen world that is now affected more than ever by the coronavirus. What would it look like if we took seriously the lordship of Jesus Christ? And what would it look like if we opened up ourselves to the power of the Holy Spirit? This is what we're going to look at today in the life of David as he faced Goliath. So the question remains to be answered. Do you need a faith lift? Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this wonderful time to come together to have a little bit of fellowship as we're all cooped up in our houses over quite a big distance for some of us. Help us today as we examine the life of David and teach us new things from your word. Open up our hearts and our minds and our ears and let our act of listening and my act of speaking be glorifying and worshiping to you. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to open up to the Old Testament, to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. And as with any good fight, we want to go to the tail of the tape. On one side, representing Philistia from the town of Gath, standing a horrifying, I can't even imagine this, nine feet and nine feet tall. His armor alone weighs 125 pounds, and his name is Goliath. Joining Goliath on the battlefield is his shield bearer, and in his corner, it says up on the hillside, is the rest of the armies of Philistia. Now, Goliath was very confident. Of course he is. I'd be very confident if I was nine feet, nine inches tall too. But alas, I'm five foot eight, so maybe one day I'll get there and I'll be a little bit more confident. But he came out and he defied the God of Israel and he actually made a deal with their armies. He says, just send one person to the battlefield. There's no need for all this bloodbath. We'll go mano a mano and the winner will enslave the other armies. And before we come to our hero representing the other corner and the armies of Israel, I just want to introduce us to a few other members of David's entourage, the first of whom is his father, Jesse. Now, Jesse, it says, has eight children, three of whom have followed Saul to the battlefield. And it's actually on behalf of his brothers that David is sent by Jesse down to the battlefield in southern Israel. And upon arriving there, it says David immediately ran to the front of the battle lines. He wasn't afraid of anything. And I just want to highlight a note just right here before we get into the text. That David runs to the front of the battle lines, but they've already been there for several days. The ranks of soldiers on both hills, the, Phil the Philistines on one hill and the Israelites on another, they face down each other. If, if you've done any research on ancient warfare... It's almost certain death to walk into battle. 
but they're willing to do it. But it's not until the moment that Goliath walks out and he says, just send one person. They have to face down their own hell all by their lonesome that they realize, I don't know if I can do this. There's something about standing with your brother and sister in Christ or your family or your loved ones that give you a confidence that lets you know that you're not alone. You can fight this battle on your own. And whatever your hell may be, whether it be anxiety or depression or addiction or financial pressures in this, in this time of coronavirus, we are willing to face down certain death as long as we're with them. The problem confronting the armies of Israel here is that they're not granted the safety of camaraderie. And that's the same problem that comes with all of us. We're not always granted that sense of community. And that can plague us. And it can paralyze us. And it can cripple us. Because we don't, because we don't realize that God is always on our side. But as we come back to our story, we're also introduced to Saul. Now Saul is the first king of Israel. He's actually had a lot of success on the battlefield. And we'll see later that Saul actually gives David his own armor. But Saul too, even with all success, being the very king of Israel, he's supposed to be the one that represents them. He too is cowering back in his tent. But Saul also didn't listen to the Lord's commands and lost his favor with God. And he forfeited his own throne. His own heir is our very hero, David. Now I wish they would have given us David's height, but they didn't. I think that would have been such an interesting kind of see how much taller Goliath actually was from him. But he's no one special. He's just a young shepherd hailing from Bethlehem. And he doesn't have any armor. He's not armed with a sword or a spear or a javelin. He says he's armed with just a sling. And to use David's own words, the name of the Lord. What an amazing weapon that is. So in essence, David is the exact opposite of what Israel needed. But that's exactly how God planned it. The shepherd has come to protect God's sheep and provide deliverance from evil and certain death. And as we look through this, at this picture with New Testament eyes, it's such an amazing picture as we see on one side the Philistines and we see on the other side the armies of Israel. And it reminds me of Jesus Christ on the cross with the two thieves in between them or on each side. On the one side we have Philistia who's hurling insults on the God of Israel. And on the other side we have people looking to the shepherd for their salvation and liberation from death. And in the middle is the culmination and the ultimate battle that brings their salvation. And as we'll see, the outcome for both is quite remarkable. So now that we've been introduced to the major players, I want to get right into the text. If you want to jump down with me to verse 20, I'm going to read down to verse 25. And it says, Now early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out, as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up the lines, facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, which he had done for 40 days. And David heard it. When the Philistines saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will have great wealth, will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage, and he will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. The first thing we note here, as I noted slightly above, is that David does not shy away from the conflict. He runs straight out to the battle line. He runs straight up to his brothers. And he was willing to fight with them. The second thing that I want to note here is that we see the army show up every single day for 40 days. I mean, that's a long time. I don't even think we've been quarantined for 40 days. Imagine being quarantined up on a hill just expecting certain death for 40 days. That's a long time. And they show up every single day just thinking maybe today the problem will go away. Maybe today the tide will turn in our favor. But they don't see a change every single day. Goliath steps out and challenges them. But all they have to do is step out in faith. All they have to do is trust in God for a change in their circumstances. They even have the, the added prize of the king's daughter. They don't have to pay taxes. It's the promise of power and prestige and riches. But even with all of this, the people are still paralyzed to go out on their own and to face down the evil of Goliath. 
And I want to go back a little bit to our illustration we made above. That there are times when our giants are there. There are times when we see it and we face it in the eye and we name what's really coming and really eating at our soul. And we show up every single day and we think today will be the day of our salvation. We see the light at the end of the tunnel. If only we can just muster up enough strength, we can face our own giants. But we're stuck and we feel ashamed and we start to feel guilty because we don't feel like we can do it all on our own. And we see this as David's brother even comes down. And he starts to scold David. He says, you've just come here to watch us all be killed. You just want to watch the battle. You're bloodthirsty. And I sat there and I thought about David's brother, the eldest of Jesse's bunch, who just one chapter before had to watch as the youngest brother, not him, was anointed to be the next king of Israel. I can just imagine how painful that must have been in ancient times. The oldest child, especially the oldest son, was the one that inherited everything. But all this honor, all the prestige wasn't given to him. It was given to the youngest. And now David has come and he wants to steal not only his rightful, maybe not rightful, but his chance to be king, but he wants to steal his glory on the battlefield that he is too afraid to claim for himself. To be frank, the armies of Israel needed a faith lift. But David is not phased by the negative people in his life. And I want to give a life lesson to all of us that if we only listen to the negative people in our life, we will not get anything done. The world is filled with negative news. It's filled with negative people in our workplaces, even in our homes sometimes. We have people that always want to speak, and they always want to speak negatively because they don't have the faith to face their own giants. But David is unfazed by this and even says in verse 32 that he goes and he decides that he's going to go face Goliath all by himself. So this brings us to our next point. That before we ever go to battle, there must be a time when we make the, the conscious decision to fight. Not only do we have to name what we're facing, we have to decide what we're going to do about it. We see this in the New Testament as Christ after Christ is baptized and he's led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. And the devil comes and he starts to tempt him. He says, turn these stones into bread. Jump from the height of the temple mount. Have the angels come and save you. If only you would bow down to me, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world. But Jesus in his resolve, he denies these temptations. Which He denies the temptation of bread, of food, of natural sustenance which is the temptation for miracle, the temptation to be subservient only to his divine will and only to his divine nature. He denies the temptation for miracle and of mystery as he is tempted to jump from the temple mount and have the angels descend from heaven and keep his foot from striking against the stone. And this protects our own faith. We're not stuck to worshiping just an act if Jesus was to be saved and we would have seen that, we would have definitely been in awe. But that would have been a proof. God doesn't want us to seek for proof from him. He wants, to, he wants those to come and worship him in spirit and in truth, who wants to come with God, even in the mystery, even when we don't have all our questions answered, we still have faith. And we still declare Jesus as Lord. And he, de and he also denies the temptation, possibly the greatest temptation for mankind, the, of authority. It's the greatest pitfall of Adam and Eve. To shake our fist at God and say, we don't need you. We can do this all on our own. And in these denials of self, Christ protects not only his divinity, but also our free will to worship God. And immediately following this, Christ goes out and it says he begins his ministry. Not with his brothers, not with his 12 disciples, as we see for the rest of his three years of ministry. He begins all by himself. And he has the same initial message as John the Baptist does. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The Greek word for repent here is metanoeta, which literally means change your heart. So it's an active verb, not a passive verb. It's an act of looking into yourself and realizing that there is something that needs to be changed. But only God can change it. And in this, know, and in this way, we know that we have the kingdom of God in us because God has made us a new creation. We've confronted the very thing inside of us that we know needs to be purged out of that being sin. And only in this way can God transfigure and do something new in us. And we see this 
kingdom of God very tangible in the life of David. As there literally is a physical kingdom of God, that being Israel. But we also see what needs to be confronted, that very evil, Goliath. But as with David, the same with Jesus, the shepherd is anointed king. And as a resolve to face down the evil and to protect his sheep. He's the unlikely hero Israel needed in a time where they only had to step out in faith and confront the enemy. But even in all this, Saul was not convinced. And he too discouraged David. However, David, again, he's emboldened a second time in the midst of his discouragement as the king of Israel decides to, to question him. And he remembers the victories God has had previously in his life, the victory over the lion and the bear as he protects his flock back in, in Bethlehem. And I love David's response to the king in verse 37. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. He's saying this to the king of Israel, the very person who's supposed to represent God to the people the most. And this little shepherd from Bethlehem has more faith than the king of Israel. So this brings us to one of our key points. When we face our giants, we must always remember the giants that God has already overcome. And I encourage you right now to take some time if you're a little bit discouraged by what's going on in the world to think about what God has already done in your life. And if you can't think of a lot of examples, just look straight to Scripture. There's so many amazing, amazing examples. I mean, even look at the Exodus. As God literally took his covenant people and brought them out of slavery. And we see this again in the New Testament with Jesus. And as we tie this into the Exodus, that we get so caught up with Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection only being for the spiritual side of things that we miss everything that God has for us. Because if God wanted only a sin offering, he only wanted an atonement for everything that has gone wrong in our life, why would God not have Jesus crucified on Yom Kippur, the specified day where the people became right with God through a sin offering? Instead, God chose the Passover, the remembrance that God brought the people out of physical slavery as well as spiritual slavery, out of economic oppression and political oppression, that God wants to redeem all aspects of our life. And moving on, I also want to point out that in David's confrontation with Saul that we should always be ready to share our testimony. I pointed this out a few weeks back in our Bible study, but I think it's helpful to mention again that your message of, deli of deliverance that God has done in your life will help someone else today, but it'll also help you later. You never know when someone just needs an encouraging word to get through their day and to face their own giants. The final thing I want to point out here as we move along further down in the passage is that Saul offers David his own armor, but David says he can't go out because he's not used to it. We can't fight our battles with someone else's armor. We can't live out our faith through the life of someone else. We must all come to a point where we decide we want to fight, where we want to serve God, where we want to enter into this history that Christ has liberated. And this appears to us in different ways. God has given all of us different gifts and different experiences that has formed who we are today. We don't have to try to be something we're not because the Holy Spirit doesn't come and try to change every little thing about us. He comes to and join with us and perfect everything about us. And he wants to use your own personality. He wants to use your own gifts to build up the kingdom of God. We need Christian writers. We need Christian police officers. We need Christian doctors, especially today, more than any other time, perhaps in, in history. We need Christian doctors. We need Christian Walmart readers. We need Christian paint store workers. That's where I work. I work at the paint store. Because we all have a mission for God. And don't let anyone try to diminish your mission, because it is very vital to the ongoing history that Christ has, has been, has started. After all, the very first time the Spirit of God descended on anyone is found in Exodus chapter 31. And it wasn't for a priest, it wasn't for a prophet, it wasn't for anyone seemingly special in the eyes of the world that we would deem special. It was simply for an artist so that he could help build up the beautiful things in God's temple. I think that's a very important point. 
that we remember that no matter how little we think our, our mission is, it is integral to the mission of God. And all of this leads us to the main event. And I want to pick up in the text back at verse 40, and we're going to read down to verse 53. And it says, Then he took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the stream. He put them in the pouch of his shepherd bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and to the wild animals. And then David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you with the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and to the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered who will know that it is not by the sword or by the spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. And as the Philistine moved close to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. Then the stone sank into his forehead as he fell face down onto the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him, and he took hold of the Philistine sword, and he drew it from his sheath. And after he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and they ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath. And when the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. So the most unlikely of victories, as Pastor Steve said, it's the ultimate underdog story. The young shepherd who didn't even come to fight has now defeated the epitome of evil. And I'd just like to point out that Goliath needed his shield bearer to go in front of him. David ran out seemingly on his own, but he wasn't alone. The Lord was ahead of David in his battle. And as we have seen as we walk through this story, it's not just a one-step process. We don't just show up one day and we decide today is the day we're going to change everything. Today is the day that our battle is going to be won. It has to, it's a process. First, David had to name his giant. He had to realize that Goliath is really the thing that's standing between me and my victory. If we cannot name what our giant is, we can never adequately face our giant. And this will always be an obstacle for our life and in our faith. Second, David had to make the conscious decision to fight and to change his circumstances. Third, David had to prepare for battle. We saw this as David reassured the king, but also he reassured himself that the Lord will be with him. And then he goes and he gathers his weapons, five stones. And David didn't gather this just because he thought he might miss four times. He gathered it because he was so sure that God was going to deliver him, that he was going to not only get Goliath, but he was also going to get Goliath's four brothers. That's how sure David was that the Lord was going to be with him. Then finally, and most importantly, David realizes that the battle is not his to fight. He declares that the battle is the Lord's. And we must realize ourselves that the battle is not ours to fight. The battle is always the Lord's. And this is not to say that we don't do anything because, of course, David ran. He didn't just walk. He didn't gallop. He didn't skip. He ran to the battle lines to fight Goliath. To realize the battle is the Lord's is not to negate our own responsibility. To realize that the battle is the Lord's is to realize that God is always working in and through us. But sometimes God tells us to be still. And this is often the hardest place to be because we have named our giant and we've decided we're going to fight. But God says, wait. And it's always so discouraging because you want that giant. You know it's right there and you know that if only I could go out and, and fight this, then it would be over. But we often are so short-sighted that we don't realize that oftentimes what God tells us to wait is because God is working in the background and he's going to bring this about in a way that's even better than we could have ever imagined. 
And on the same note as the body of Christ, we're in very unprecedented times for the first time in American history that I know of. Even the church has been shut down. We've shut our doors and we have all sorts of controversy all around, all around the country of some churches refusing to close and the media starts to bash them and then other churches that um, stay open and then the government comes and they decide to close the people and disperse them. And it's very easy to get angry at both of these situations. But this is such an amazing opportunity for the people in the church of God as we're reminded of our mission so that when we come out of this, because one day we will come out. In the near future, this lockdown will be over. And God willing, in the near future, this pandemic will be over. But our mission will not be over. Our battle will remain the same. So th this is such an encouraging time. We shouldn't be beat down. We shouldn't be the people on social media that are ranting and raving about politics or about any of the small minutiae of life. We should be the people that are filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And as I was reflecting earlier this week on the final chapter of Revelation, I noticed a very, very interesting trend as Christ is speaking to his church. And I say Christ is speaking because Christ is always the initiator and the church is the response. Look, I am coming soon, says the risen Christ. And our response is, the spirit and the bride say come. Christ then responds, yes, I am coming soon. And our response is, amen, come Lord Jesus. Now as we're reflecting upon these very three simple words, amen, come Lord Jesus. Maybe in this time of the coronavirus, we take a little bit more time to reflect upon what our mission is. Maybe during this time of the coronavirus, we spend a little bit more time listening to God rather than trying to speak for God on social media. Maybe it's time that we stop trying to speak where it's not our place to speak. Maybe it's time for us to just simply be and just simply respond, come, Lord Jesus. And while our reach into the world is limited, our God is not limited. God is still drawing the world to himself every moment. In the Church of the Nazarene, we call it provenient grace. But we often like to dichotomize ourselves. We like to separate ourselves off and say, well, we're the church and they're the world. But we forget that God is still always drawing the church to himself. That's you and I, everyone listening to this right now but only we're willing to listen and to respond. But I have to warn you, if we actually get serious about listening to God, if we actually get serious about saying, come Lord Jesus, we actually start to get serious about proclaiming the resurrection and the coming of our Lord, the risen Lord, God will start to speak. And pretty soon he'll start prodding you. He'll start telling us to go. And they'll start telling us that once this pandemic is over, once this giant for the church is over, we have to declare the victory. So as I close, I just want to pray with you all and encourage you that even while we're all cooped up, even while we're all separated and we're all in our homes, you're not alone. This pandemic will end. But for some of us, our giants will still be there. We'll still have economic pressures. We'll still have the, a severed relationship. We'll still have depression or anxiety. And I want to encourage you that the church is always here for you. You can always call us. You can always email us. You can always message us on Facebook and we'll be there to pray with you or provide whatever needs you may have. We hope you stay in contact with us. And we hope that this message of David and Goliath will help you better face your giants. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the life of David. We thank you for this young shepherd that decided to step out in faith and trust in the Lord. We thank you for our good shepherd. We thank you for Jesus Christ, who came down from heaven, who was murdered on a cross, who was raised bodily and was ascended into heaven. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, 
for coming down and connecting heaven to earth and giving us gifts and giving us new life and making us new creations. I pray for anyone within the sound of my voice and even for our community that whatever giant they're facing, that you will go and you will intersect their life and you will start speaking new life into them. You'll start um, breaking down walls. You'll start um, severing, or not severing, you'll start mending relationships. And you'll start warming our hearts so that when this pandemic ends, when this church is finally allowed to unleash its power and go out into the world and share the love of Christ in new ways, that we'd simply remain. We say, amen. Come, Lord Jesus.